Welcome to English 430 and 560. These are the podcasts for Shakespeare's drama, produced by and starring Dr. Bill Dines. The introduction to A Midsummer Night's Dream in The Norton Shakespeare invites us to, quote, imagine an aristocratic wedding in an English Grange house. Imagine that after the solemnities and the wedding supper, the newlyweds are treated to a private entertainment, a play written specially for them, end quote. To which I'd add, if that play was A Midsummer Night's Dream, imagine the playwright being imprisoned or fined for insubordination. The myth that A Midsummer Night's Dream was written to help celebrate an aristocratic wedding is, as the introduction goes on to admit, just that, a myth. For all I know, it may be true, but I doubt it. There are many reasons for that skepticism, but chief among them is my sense that the play doesn't really celebrate love and marriage, at least not as we value them today. As you read, you can't help but ask yourself just which of these marriages, current or prospective, have much of a chance of being happy ones. Theseus, after all, wooed Hippolyta with his sword. Demetrius has thrown over Helena for Hermia, who loves Lysander despite, or perhaps because of, her father's ardent disapproval of him. Oberon and Titania can't meet without falling into a name-calling spat. Where's the love? Shakespeare, I think, was very interested in the stories that we tell ourselves. And in this play, he's most interested in the stories that we tell other people in order to establish, change, or maintain our relationships with them. That's a radical concept, especially in Renaissance England in the twilight of Elizabeth's reign. The received wisdom of the time is that the web of relationships in which we find ourselves is both natural and supernatural. Supernatural because those relationships are constructed by God and natural because they're a manifestation of the way that we live in the day-to-day world. Fathers are naturally responsible for their children, husbands for their wives, kings for their subjects. You can see the appeal of such a cosmology. Everything has a place, one designed by a benevolent deity for our mutual health and happiness. We have the obligation to live responsibly within that place. If we do so, we'll be rewarded both in this life and in the next. The problem, of course, is that many weaknesses and fissures were beginning to appear in that cosmology. If the structures of our lives, that is, our families, our nations, and so on, if those aren't permanent and unchanging, what does hold us together? How do we make sense of relationships that defy tradition? How do we make sense of the difference between who we feel we should be and who we feel we actually are. One sign of the severity of these questions comes in Act Two of the play, when Oberon and Titania first meet. As you read Titania's brilliant monologue, notice the connections that she implies between the inner emotional world and the outer natural world. There's catastrophe in nature, she says, because you and I can't get along. Sure, these are the king and queen of the fairies, So, of course, their fights have large consequences. But haven't we all felt that way from time to time? Have a fight with your significant other in the morning, and no matter what the real weather is, somehow the sun just isn't shining that day. The reciprocal relationship between the objective world and the subjective world is something we're used to recognizing now. Shakespeare sets it on stage for us. In this same argument, Titania explains why she will not yield the changeling boy Oberon demands of her with another story, one of loyalty and devotion that she feels supersedes her responsibilities to her husband and king. It's a beautiful passage, isn't it? And it's one of the first that I know of in which a woman's relationship with another woman is understood to take precedence over her relationship with a man. Compare this story with the one Aegeus tells Theseus about how Lysander stole Hermia in Act 1, C1, or the story Lysander tells Helena to explain why he's suddenly so deeply in love with her, Act 2, Scene 2. The idea that our relationships with others are constructed by the stories that we tell, consciously or unconsciously, carries some radical implications. 
One is that we have some control over these stories. Our destiny is not written for us. And so we can choose to slip out of town and elope to our widow dowager aunt's house. Or we can choose to trick our wives into falling in love with some beast. Another implication is that we have a responsibility to the stories that we tell. And when we fail to live up to those responsibilities, we betray and hurt others, and perhaps ourselves as well. These notions are ultimately given their most entertaining development in the presence of Peter Quince's plain troop, and especially Shakespeare's first great clown character, Nick Bottom. It's not an accident that Nick Bottom is a weaver. He weaves together the world of the court and the forest, the high and the low, prose and poetry. He knows that there's a difference between himself, the person, and the amorous knight Pyramus that he's supposed to play. But it's so easy for him to lose sight of the distinction between those two, isn't it? At some level, he knows that life isn't simply lived, it's performed. And that's why when you come to read Puck's closing epilogue, you might want to do so with some caution. Can we simply dismiss what we haven't enjoyed as a mere dream? Can you take anything Puck says completely seriously?